I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for November 7, 2017. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Gregory Hickman, a Sparrows Point Middle School uh, student, along with his parents. Uh, we then will remain standing for a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda is to consider the agenda. Mrs. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions to the agenda. Mr. Hearing none. Chairman, I, I have a motion to add an, an item to our agenda called Lansdowne High School State Funding Request. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yes, I'd like to discuss it. Uh, there's some reasons that it needs to be on tonight's agenda. Um, number one, this uh, meeting is the last one, I believe, that the board could move to change the state funding request in time for this year's funding cycle in order to ask for uh, state funding this year for FY19. Um, also, at the last Board of Public Works meeting, uh, the Maryland Comptroller Peter Francho directed BCPS to pursue a replacement school instead of a reno. So that may have and should have an impact in, on maybe perhaps some of the decision making of the board. Uh, and I believe that if Mr. Stewart were to support this motion, I think that the board would pay deference and pass this motion. Uh, the, are, you, are you still have more? A little Sorry bit more. Sorry about that. Um, we've heard from hundreds of stakeholders asking for a replacement school, but the only people supporting the reno are eight board members, the county executive and councilman Quirk. So essentially 10 people are holding up a, re a replacement school for Lansdowne High. The board is asking the county taxpayers to put $65 million into renovating a structurally unsound building versus replacement where 44% of the funding would come from the state, so it's nearly a break even for the county. So for these reasons, I ask that we uh, be able to reconsider that motion. Very good, I'll remind the board that uh, policy, uh, board policy requires us to be unanimous to change the agenda. Mr. Sort, did you? Sure, so um, I have some doubt about the willingness of board members to defer to me on nearly anything, but that's interesting of you to say so. Um, I'll say that I have been told that we are going to get the full design for the renovation back in two weeks at our next meeting. I think it would be malpractice in the highest degree for us to go ahead and, and uh, propose what Ms. Miller is proposing, which is to consider this project, reject it, kill this renovation, and pursue a replacement school, putting it behind the other projects we've already talked about, um, and subjecting kids to uh, a, an additional period of time, years, uh, of the conditions at their high school. So I am going to be voting no. All right, in light of the fact that Mr. Short has already reflected he's gonna vote <laughs> no, I'm gonna call the question on this because it only requires one vote to uh, defeat the motion. All in favor of Ms. Miller's motion to agen uh, amend the agenda, please uh, raise your hand. All right, the motion fails. And could um, we co complete the, um, the uh, count then? Uh, it needed to be unanimous. Right, and so those opposing, could we ask? So we raise your hand if you support, raise your hand if you supported that motion. The motion to just discuss to the issue. The motion to change the agenda. Uh, the, it was Mr. Hayden, Ms. Causey, uh, Ms. Schaefer, Ms. Miller, and Ms. Hen. And then can we complete the vote? Now we have a motion to, um, uh, to approve the agenda order. as prepared. Point of order, Mr. Gillis, could we complete that vote? Uh, it needed a un unanimity, so there's need, no need to take any other vote. Uh, but, in, but if I'm asking for it, can we complete that vote? There is no need to take that vote. All right, so you know the five that voted in favor. 
All right, all in favor of the motion to approve the agenda as prepared, please say aye. 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 All right, we'll proceed. I'm voting no. I also right. voted no. I also okay. vote no. Okay. I also this, vote this no. This is why we should be completing votes. All righty, there's four opposed. <clears throat> okay. Next on our agenda is selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight for the public comment portion of the meeting. Uh, Ms. Schaefer will pull the names, and Mr. Birch will read the names. Angela Dawson. Bosch Farun. Mohammed Tamiz. Sharon Saroff. Russ Keen. Diana Bergman. Eric Edwards. Leslie Weber. All right, the next item uh, is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested persons. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to use, utilize existing uh, resolution processes as appropriate. Uh, I ask each of you to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that your time has expired. I now call our advisory group members to speak. The first to sign up is TABCO's <coughs> representative, Abby Baton. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, and members of the board. There never seems to be a time during the school year where we aren't over the top busy. Whether it is the beginning of the year or the end of the quarter or state testing or any of the myriad of, of items that need to be accomplished throughout the year, there is re rarely any downtime. I am pleased to share that our collaboration with BCPS surrounded, surrounding several issues has been notched up in a mo much more effective and timely manner. We met with BCPS tech officials to show the problems our teachers are experiencing with access to curriculum. Several insights were gained on both sides to help guide the fixes to the problems. We have scheduled further meetings surrounding discipline to collaborate on system-wide protocols that can be tailored to each school. This work is critical, but must, not, must be not only effective, but user-friendly and workable at all levels and demographics. We are also, in, also continuing our efforts surrounding special education. We are collaborating our, on system-wide information sharing and guidelines to bring more understanding to various special education issues and expectations. For the first time, our collaboration really has begun to feel like true collaboration. We understand that with collaboration comes compromise. I wish more people understood that compromise is the only way to make sure all voices have had a part in the process and ideas from all have been incorporated in the final product in some way. It is the way forward, not only for us here in Baltimore County, but for our elected officials as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, and that's Megan Stewart Sicking. Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, members of the board, good evening to all of you. Thank you. 
First, I want to thank those who presented at our CCAC meeting last night on social emotional development. Patricia Mustafer, Beth Lambert, Melanie Martin, Rebecca Ryder, and all the many staff members who were there. And also thank Mr. Virch for attending, as well as Dr. Penelope Martin Knox, just a couple rows behind me. It was wonderful to see all of you. Before we talk about specific budget items, I want to talk about our general concern tonight. With regard to teachers, there are several things we all know. We know that our teachers are overwhelmed by class sizes, caseloads, and administrative demands. We know that we have a resulting problem with teacher retention and recruitment. We know that we don't have enough special education teachers to support all students and classroom teachers who then bear the burden of scarce resources. And yet, when we come to budget time, we can't get anywhere close to what the Office of Special Ed needs to solve these problems. We do things like take the number we actually need, divide it by a number of years, and call it a multi-year plan. In the meantime, while trying to reach the original number, we fall farther and farther behind. With regard to behavior, we know that behavior problems continue to increase and place even more stress on teachers and students. We know that disability-related behavior issues will arise. We know that students with autism, our fastest growing IEP population, will need many levels of behavioral support. And we know that applied behavior analysis has been an evidence-based best practice intervention for students with autism for years. And yet, when we come to budget time and we talk about BCBAs, we talk about hiring numbers like one, or maybe two, for our entire system. And here's the final thing we know. Infants and toddlers sees consistent increases in referrals and the number of young children receiving services. And we know that those littler children will grow into older children who have needs in our classrooms. Over time, we will not fall behind at the same rate at which we are behind now. With enrollment needs increase and needs increasing, we will fall behind at an increasing rate. And we're highly concerned that without real proactive budgetary solutions, we will end up with the special ed equivalent of brown drinking water in our schools. And people will look around and say things like, didn't we see this coming? And why didn't we do anything about it before it got this bad? Before we get there, it's our hope that this board will work with us and with the Office of Special Ed to seriously and proactively meet the needs we have and those we can see coming. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County. That's Jane Lee. My intent was to come here and give you the list of all the calls and everything I've gotten, but then last night happened. First, I got a call from a local PTA asking if they were allowed to send out a notice of a community meeting about a zoning change across the street from the school, and my answer, of course, was absolutely. Can we take a position? Absolutely, I suggest you go to the community meeting, ask your questions, then get back together and make up your minds what position you want to take. And then after midnight, I received not one, not two, but three copies of the following letter from its school administrator. Through the lens of an employee of BCPS and an administrator, I strongly caution this PTA from getting involved in any fashion for or against. Principals have been removed from their positions as a result of actions of their PTAs and booster organizations. While they are not supposed to oversee their efforts, they are still expected to have an understanding of what these organizations are doing as representatives of the school community and have been known to be held accountable for the actions of these groups. If anyone on this board wants to disseminate information, that is your decision, but I ask that it not come from the PTA and that my name not be associated with sharing of this information, as people tend to have difficulty separating personal and professional opinions when it comes to education. Please note that this is not from the administrator of the school involved, even. Let me make it clear that this board and BCPS employees have no right to bully their PTAs in their buildings by threatening to remove principals if a PTA chooses to advocate. First and foremost, PTA's mission is to advocate for their children in school and in the community. 
I don't care if it's about behavior problems, transportation problems, water, stat, school boundaries, or proposed zoning changes across from their school. PTAs are supposed to speak for their membership and under the guidance of their membership. If this administrator is correct in their assessment that the system is putting pressure on them to shut their PTAs up, then shame on you all. That's a problem that needs to be dealt with. I'm hoping that I will find out that a letter went out to administrators informing them that PTA is an advocacy group and they need to advocate because I will be encouraging them to continue to do so. Now, the calls, the emails, they were on the New York Times article, they were on the Sun Papers article, and they were on closing schools. The count is five to one that the parents want the schools closed for safety. We will get back to the other articles because we, the, the question asked of me is where's the oversight from this board? I need an answer to take back to parents. Our next speaker is from the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County, and that's Lila Marinbloom. Good evening, Superintendent White, Chairman Gillis, and Baltimore County Board of Education. I'm here to talk to you about the National ESP Day. National ESP Day is the Wednesday of American Education Week, which is celebrated the first full week before Thanksgiving. This year, the day will fall on Wednesday, November 15th. The object of the day is to honor and recognize the contributions made by educational support professionals, or ESPs, to public education. We are part of a whole education workforce serving the whole student. Too often, ESP contributions are overlooked or considered insignificant, but that trend is changing. As we move towards school reform, ESPs are there on the front lines. The end result, where ESPs are involved, the school and community teams, you have better schools and more successful students. Most people don't distinguish between teachers and ESPs. They don't understand or appreciate that we ESPs work hand in hand with teachers, administrators, and parents to help every student succeed. By being able to provide personal attention to at-risk students or students who just come in with low self-esteem, we can take the time to try and make a difference for that student and his or her classmates. Some students just need a little or some a lot more help. Hopefully, we are there to provide it. We all make a difference. It's not just a job for us, it's a career. I'm asking that ESP Day be acknowledged on the school's website starting on Monday, November 13th, and that principals and administrators be encouraged to acknowledge this day at the work site as well. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from Case. That's Tom DeHart. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening again, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, and members of the board. You may recall that in my first message to the board when I took this job, I emphasized the need for consistency through all facets of the organization and the need for ongoing professional development and support for school-based leaders. On September 26th, I shared with the board Case's enthusiasm of the system designed for ongoing professional development for principals assistant principals and stat teachers at monthly meetings. I've had the opportunity to attend the first three monthly professional development sessions uh, for the principals. I've also attended two of the sessions for assistant principals and stat teachers. 
As an old professional developer centered around leadership development, I'm pleased to share with you my thoughts of the sessions thus far, and I'm going to use our current rating system. They've been highly effective. They've been well designed and presented with a very deliberate and purposeful message around literacy and the effective use of data to improve instruction. Principals have worked in small groups clustered by high school feeder patterns and facilitated by community superintendent, an executive director, a director, or a CNI coordinator. This model allows for much needed networking between principals with the same communities, creating a clear vertical dialogue. The fact that area office leadership is ingrained in the learning contributes to consistency of the message. The three sessions have, built, uh, have been built upon one another and principals and assistant principals have been reminded consistently that this is a year of learning and they aren't expected to take this new learning back and implement it all at once. This new learning is creating dialogue, developing the mindset, and setting the stage for real change in the schoolhouse but it's happening in a purposeful fashion and not in the strategy of the month mentality too often associated with educational change. I've reviewed the feedback given to the Office of Organizational Development and was consistently positive and I want to share some of the comments. Best principals meeting in the last two years. Outstanding format and content. Love today's professional learning. I even said so in a tweet. This style of learning was effective and engaging Megan Shea was very effective. I mention this one because Megan is the leader of this learning. Literacy PD structure was effective, interactive, and allowed for meaningful discourse. I enjoyed this style of learning. It was great to have such, so much time to engage in meaningful discussions. It improved the connection between literacy and PARC. It provided clarity of expectations and next steps. Talking to other administrators helps clarify thinking. Great connections between literacy and our data points, very important session this month. Great examples of leading and lagging data. Well thought out questions. There's much more, but obviously I've run out of time. Uh, I was within 10 seconds. Ah, oh, so close. <laughs> so close, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Northeast Area Advisory Council. That's Thor Trigvison. Good evening, board members. Recently, the uh, Northeast Advisory held its pre-budget hearing where we received valuable input from our community. <coughs> I would like to review three things um, from that input. One is uh, sports facilities, and two is improved access to buildings, and three is overcrowding. I would first like to talk about the need for a turf field at Kenwood High. Kenwood is the home of the BCPS Sports Magnet Program. It should be the crown jewels of sports at high school level. Unfortunately, the facilities there are in dire straits. They need a turf field to accommodate more sports and to be able to play longer. The school also needs to have the running track and tennis courts resurfaced. The school that should be the prime location for sports training and education has barely any sports facilities in a functioning state. This should be high on the repair list for BCPS. Second, I'd like to talk about improved access to Kenwood High School and Golden Ring Middle School. These inexpensive improvements would allow the usage of front entrance of these buildings for visitors instead of the back entrances. Further information will be found in a documentation that I will share with you after my speech. Third and finally, I would like to draw your attention to the overcrowding in the Northeast area. 57% of the elementary school <coughs> overcrowding in the BCPS school system is in the Northeast area. Even with the new elementary school that's being built, we will still be the most overcrowded elementary school area in, in, um, within BCPS. More needs to be done for the area and steps taken to be, by BCPS to prevent this magnitude of overcrowding from happening again. Safe and adequate facilities must come before devices. Since I still have time, I would like to mention that special education kids have to endure inhumanely long trips to and from schools. We urge the board to find ways to shorten these trips for these children. 
Bus overcrowding is still an issue that needs to be addressed. Bus manufacturers say that no more than two students to a seat on middle and high school levels, anything above that is not safe. The safety equipment doesn't work with three students to a seat. Please stop gambling with our children's safety to save a buck for the county. Thank you. All right, now it's time for public comment and the first speaker is Angela Dawson. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Angela Dawson, and I am the vice principal, pr vice president, I'm sorry, <laughs> of the PTSA at Randallstown High School. The Randallstown High School community wants to express that uh, Ms. White has been doing a, a great job and in, as in her interim role. And um, we want to know whether she could be considered for the role permanently. <coughs> Uh, supporting, she has been supporting the efforts of the principal and the school to move the educational initiatives forward. She is supportive of our efforts to increase advanced placement participation, participation and uh, teacher development and inclusion of parent input in discussions relating to school performance. And that's all I have to say. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferron. Dr. Ferron. Chairman, may I take four minutes? You got three. Three? Three. Okay. Good evening to all. Every speaker is three minutes. Why would you give four minutes to one person? For the holidays, why would you close the schools on the Jewish holidays and not offer the equal treatment for Muslims? who are residents in the county and taxpayers. I have been for 20 years asking for inclusion, asking for equity, asking for equality. The school system never had objective or verifiable data about the number of teachers or students of one faith or the other. Thus, the closure on the Jewish holidays has been and continues to be purely political and not really secular. I came to you always for equity and equality. And I sat in this board for 13, 14 years, and I heard for hundreds of times from you board members, equity, equality, diversity, inclusion. It is about time to make the words into actions. I believe that if you turn down my humble request for closing on the Muslim holidays equal to the Jewish holidays. This is an effective Muslim ban in the school system. It just doesn't have that name. It makes residents not apply to the school system because they don't see that they are really welcome. It makes students not really look up to their peers I believe the school system is about education, and the calendar is really a poster for the school system. If you continue the practice of 20 years closing on the Jewish holidays without secular reason, and of course not offering the equal treatment to Muslim Americans in the county, then you are educating the future generation in the wrong way. You are playing favoritism to one group just because they have political clout or other factors. Some ask me, you know, where are the Muslims? I brought you this 800 signatures last year. Hundreds came here in 2004, 2005, 2006, and now it's very hard to get Muslims to come to speak up, and they're standing be so. So for all that, in my 13 seconds, 
our constitution allows for separation of religion from government. And our codes basically advocate equity and equality. It's really your words. I truly and honestly ask you to do it this year. Equal holiday. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mohammed Jamil. Peace and good evening, good evening, Chair Gillis, Superintendent Ms. White, and members of the board. It was enlightening to hear the details of the school climate, including the student behavior and conduct in the last board meeting. The comments generated during the question and answer by the board members are worthy of being repeated because the report and its findings also seem to be applicable to the board itself. Here are some of those in brief. School administrators not enforcing policies. Policies need to be strengthened through consistency. Race-based is a double standard. Disproportionate disciplinary actions. Discriminatory disciplinary actions by administrators. There's a need for application of both the equity as well as the equality. One of the board members was honest in his comments and said, teachers have prejudices and biases do come out because it is human. Therefore, here's an issue that has been raised since 1998 and it begs the question, how much of the climate in the board is affecting the denial of equality and equity in the Baltimore County public school system for the students who happen to be Muslims. You do have the answers in the report that was presented. It comes under the heading restoration and labeled under the title restorative questions. They are what happened, what were you thinking of at the time, what have you thought about since? Who has been affected by what you have done in what way? What do you think you need to do to make things right? I respectfully dare say that each one of you is smart and capable. You do know the answers to these restorative questions. Ms. Desmond from the Maryland State Board of Education had testified years ago and implied that this board had opened the door which could not be shut and that the Maryland State Board would have no objection about the closing of the schools on Muslim holidays. So the time is now if you have honestly, truthfully answered the questions. <coughs> Add the two holidays in the calendar. That is equity and equality. Thank you, and God bless you. Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening, members of the board. Good evening. And, uh, Assistant Harris Superintendent. I'm here to speak once again about quality in this county concerning school buildings and the lack of safety and the poor environment and the message that that sends to our students inside those buildings. I applaud Ann Miller and Kathy Causey for attempting numerous times to bring the cause of the stakeholders of the Lansdowne community, the stakeholders who are your taxpayers, and this board has time and time again said no. 
what kind of a message is that sending to the students of the Lansdowne High School? It sends a message, you don't care. I'm gonna to read to you some facts, some facts that have been disputed to me. Lansdowne has a score of 174. Delaney and Towson, 245 and 236. 199 is poor. Anything below that, you, ne you better fix it. And yet, are you interested in fixing Lansdowne? No. You're not interested in replacing that building. You're interested in letting the students of that school continue to deal with multiple level changes. I have braces on my feet from arthritis. Whenever I go into that building to observe a client, I have to climb stairs, and by the time I get to the top of those stairs, I'm out of breath because of my physical disability. And at the last school board meeting, I noted that a child had to be removed from that building because he broke his leg. We have a building skin that is failing. I was told the building structure is sound. How can it be both? We need to replace this building, not fix it. I understand you want to give these, the engineers a chance, Mr. Stewart, but we're out of chances. We've had pipes bursting during school hours, and we're not interested in fixing those things. We're only interested in giving these people a token renovation because of the zip code they're in. And you're giving, because Towson is your county seat, you want to give them a brand new school. That's not equality. Ages. Our next speaker is Russ Kuhn. Mr. Kuhn. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, there have been a lot of issues brought up tonight. Unfortunately, I only have less than three minutes left, so I'm not going to be able to talk about all of them. Um, one thing I will talk about very quickly, uh, Mr. Stewart, um, was your denial of the motion to move forward on um, even discussing a replacement instead of just a renovation. and. I know there's processes in place. I'm just wondering if the board could think out of the box a little bit and say, okay, at the very minimum we want, we want a renovation, but let's talk to the state if they're willing to go in with the money for an actual build, right? So I think you shut that down and other, other members should start thinking that way too because somebody's gotta do something. Um, I'll also point out that it is um, a great time to borrow money. Uh, rates are historically low. So if you're going to do capital intensive planning and spending, now is the time to do it. The Fed's poised to continue to raise rates over the next two plus years and beyond. Now, I came here because Baltimore County made the front page of the New York Times, which is concerning to me because it's not a positive glowing response to activity that has been underway in the county now for several years. Um, I started coming to these meetings uh, because I got interested and, and I heard um, there was going to be laptops handed out to every student in the county. I thought, wow, that's a lot of money. <laughs> I'm going to start paying attention to this. Um, and as I've looked closer and closer, I've become more and more concerned with the spending um, and the, the, um, the taxpayer dollars going into these programs. Uh, and, and I voiced my concern uh, probably about two years ago, that $1,600 la laptops were awfully expensive when Chromebooks could be gotten for $200 to $350 at an eighth to a quarter of a cost. And we're talking about $200 million spend. And that's a significant amount of money. Um, you could probably build a school with what you saved if you, if you, um, if you looked at that closely. Um, the last thing I want to um, say, because I know I'm running out of time, that um, Ms. White, I wish you the best. Um, I'm, I'm hoping for your success. I have four children in Baltimore County Schools out of the five that I have. Um, so I need you to be successful. Um, 
Um, but one of the things in the article uh, struck me um, as concerning, it had to do with the Education Research Development Institute, ERDI, and, and you've um, partaken in that, and I know you did it on your own time and with your own money. Um, but I would suggest while you're acting as superintendent um, to restrain yourself from uh, partaking in that activity since it seems geared towards giving vendors access. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm walking over here and they're saying my name. And, <laughs> and um, I want to say thank you because um, we had a party today at Lansdowne High School. Our delegates came out. Miss White was there. Nick was there. Mr. Gillis, you came. I was, it was a positive um, feeling. I, I felt as a community member, we are supported. and. I, I believe this board does care. I had a rough weekend with this New York Times article. <laughs> um, yes, Baltimore County um, made it on there, and I want to share a little story. Before I was, me and my family were stationed here. We were stationed in the state of California. About 2008, 2009, we got here to Maryland around 2010. I watched the state of California become absolutely broke in education because they headed towards these technology devices and Silicon Valley is right there and it, they struggled. They struggled, those children struggle. And I get here to Baltimore County and I'm like, oh, they don't have one-on-one -on -one devices, but I figure you guys had tech classes or something along the you didn't really have something. So I saw you guys were a little bit behind, but there was no need to go overboard. And that's what I felt you guys went overboard. And I think a lot of the teachers realized that and some administrators paid attention to that. And it hurt a lot of supporting departments. And it's made it difficult from transportation, special education, your ESOL programs, your gifted programs for your elementary school students. Um, it made it quite challenging. And I know everybody on here cares, and we have a lot of new board members that are new. So pay attention to these contracts that you're putting in because these are our children, and we want better for them. Um, we want better facilities, a better learning environment to give them the room and space that they need in a healthy building. It doesn't have to be a castle but just healthy, healthy. <coughs> Look at what we're doing to these kids. There's some key basic necessities that we're missing and don't let technology eat away on that by going over or too much of something is never good. So I'm just asking for more invitations, more parties at Lansdowne High School, doing the best thing. And you know what, I, I support Nick. We want the facts. That's what me and Mr. Miller said. Give us the facts so we can make a sound decision for this community and make it with those facts. If $60 million is not enough, I Thank you, Ms. Bourbon. Our next speaker is Eric Edwards. All right. All right. Board members, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak again. And um, Diana may mention about having parties. And who doesn't like a good party, right? Um, one thing I was kind of really considering uh, last time I was here was just really speaking on uh, the situation as, as we're approaching how to effectively handle the disciplinary challenges that are happening within BCPS. And I brought to the table the thought of 
incorporating mental screening into uh, the screening for our, the, the health screening for our children, um, vision and dental. Um, you, know, it's, you, know, it's, you know, those are standard things that are screened, but the mental health part, which I think we, we're probably just doing a poor, a very poor job at doing, as far as really focusing on that, is something that I really think should be thought about. Um, you know, we look at some of the recent events that have happened. David Kelly. Now, many of us probably don't know his name because there have been so many mass murders, um, you know, you know, mass, you know, mass killings that have happened. But David Kelly was the gentleman who actually killed all maybe there was 26 people in the church just recently. And there's been information that's been put out stated regarding his mental health. He, President Trump's even saying something that's correct that um, mental health was more likely the challenge, you know, one of the pieces behind that. Um, then there's another person that probably don't know too much about. Um, his name is Spencer Height. Now, his uh, mass murdering wasn't as grand as um, the, you know, Mr. Kelly's was. He only killed eight people, his ex-wife and her seven friends at a football party. It happened in Texas as well. Both the same state, unfortunately, didn't get as much press. The bottom line that I'm really focusing on is that it's not what and how, because people think about, is it the gun-related situation? And I know disciplinary part is not really focused on the guns. What we're talking about basically how to effectively handle the issues, it's more so that why. Why did we let these individuals get to this point? Looking at our kids, when they are having these issues, our children, your kids, my kids, if your kids are actually going to the Baltimore County Public Schools, that we have that you are supporting, then I'm, I'm encouraging you to visit those schools and understand what's going on and then maybe ask these kids what's going on in their lives. Have those kind of parties that really bring those kids together and connect with them. Help them to feel that you really care because when it comes down to it, when it comes to respect, as I'm, I've been mentoring kids for the past 20 years and what I always see is that the way that I can get them to be properly disciplined is to show them the respect that I would ask them to provide me. And without that respect provided, or at least understanding what's going on in their lives, then I don't know how to handle them and how to deal with and how to Thank you so much for that. Our next speaker is Leslie Weber. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Board of Education members, and Ms. White. I'm Leslie Weber speaking tonight as a co-founder of Advocates for Baltimore County Schools, or ABC Schools. I have to address recent reporting in the Baltimore Sun and the New York Times about ethics, ethics concerns and about troubling issues tied to the STAT initiative, including the EdTech industry's influence on our school system. It's clear to me that an independent, external audit of our system is needed. Baltimore County taxpayers need answers to the questions raised by the Sun and the New York Times, which echo questions raised by some Board of Education members and concerned citizens whose test, who have testified before this board. The BCPS fiscal, 19, fiscal year 19 budget is now in the planning stage. It's time to take an honest look at the true costs of our digital initiative. For example, why was, an, why was an extremely expensive and now discontinued device chosen for leasing when it wasn't the most highly rated option? A separate potential audit, audit target could be the $10 million scholarship ID contract. Nearly $4 million has been spent, with over 200000 being paid out each year for this program, defunct after two years. Over the years, ABC Schools, PTA Council, and community members have spoken about spoken out about the staggering cost of STAT, its opportunity costs, the safety risks of very young children using devices, including danger to their eyes and the detrimental effects on their social and emotional development, uh, the, and the lack of credible research pointing to the efficacy of using devices for curriculum delivery. At recent Board of Ed and Curriculum Committee meetings, the Johns Hopkins researchers evaluating STAT and BCPS curriculum experts could point to only minor achievement gains. In some cases, test scores actually decreased. JHU also reported rampant misuse of devices and little improvement in critical thinking skills. The cost of STAT is approaching $300 million and could be actually higher. 
Every line item of the BCPS budget is being rated to fund this initiative. What could be done with this money? Hungry children could be fed, wraparound services could be offered to at-risk students and their families, schools could be repaired and constructed, air conditioning could be installed, teachers, guidance counselors, social workers, educational assistants, pupil personnel workers and behavior intervention, interventionists could be hired, mentoring programs could be instituted and class sizes could be reduced. All address the root causes of achievement gaps. They fill students' most basic needs and create safer school environments. That's leveling the playing field. That's equity. Equity is not achieved by giving every student a device. All students, especially at-risk students, need more humans, not more tech. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is um, the opportunity for the public to speak on uh, Board of Education policies that, that are under consideration for change or deletion. The first is policy 3130, non-instructional services, non-instructional services products and services for purchase by students. There's one speaker signed up and that is Diana Bergman. Hi. Um, so this is for the non-instructional service policy for the students and how they, I guess, use the venues and the policy that you guys have to follow. It doesn't have the rule attached, so I don't know the details how it's going to be created, but basically when I thought about this is um, a school one area pocket of BCPS versus the fees that they have if they're going to use, um, use a vendor for spirit wear for children. Um, you know, some communities could afford $20 for a sweatshirt while others could barely afford $5. Um, so one of the things that I know about trying to get uniforms from coaching softball and baseball is the more you order, the cheaper it is. So um, each school gets their little pot of money of how they use money for to build morale in the school with the spirit wear and stuff with the kids and when they use these vendors. Um, is there any way to possibly consider a process where you use a couple vendors that you buy quantity stock of for your school so it could be cheaper and that way when the kids want to order spirit wear, you don't have some kids that can't afford it. Because sometimes some of our schools don't have active PTA that could fundraise thousands of dollars for the year. They could barely do three to four thousand dollars. So um, that's the only thing that came to mind regarding this policy as they have to make the rule for it is to uh, allow an option of considering to not just make these vendors compatible but affordable for some of those communities that don't have a strong PTA supporting or parent organization supporting them financially to support spirit wear for the kids. Thank you. Ms. Bergman, say put, there are six uh, policies on the agenda tonight. That was the first of six. Um, you have signed up for all six. Um, the next one is a proposed deletion of policy 3510, non-instructional services, physical plant services, and operations. Okay, so can I just combine all three of the plant stuff so you guys just want to remove them? No? Okay. No, so this is the proposed deletion of 3510. Do you have any comments on it? Okay, so 3510, it's just a short policy, and no, I don't have a comment. I'm okay, well, stay put there because the next ones are coming up. Okay. Um, also signed up for this proposed deletion of policy 3510 is Sharon Saroff. I think I signed up for the wrong one. Okay, very good. The next. Policy for dis, uh, public comment is proposed changes to policy 3520, non-instructional services, physical plant services, maintenance and operations. Ms. Bergman. Okay, so this is the one that's going to replace 3510, correct? This is proposed changes to existing policy 3520. <laughs> Okay. 
I was like, my whole thing with the plants and services that I was concerned about is some of these plants that we have in some of the facilities. Um, like if you look at the beautification outside of the buildings of some of our school buildings, the environment, the curve appeal of the school, if you would call it, um, over the years it seems like it just got very plain. Um, I've talked to groundskeepers in my community that are retired, and they used to tell me that outside of the school and the groundkeeping used to have these beautiful flowers. There was color and, and greenery that was brought to the building, and they seen some of the bushes get um, very overgrown. So I'll give you an example. Baltimore Highlands, that elementary school used to have these tulips that would come up in the spring that the kids would plant for like Mother's Day or something. And you could see all the tulips, and it was all colorful. But over time, it's like they didn't continue that tradition of maintaining those plants and that beautification piece of the outside of that school and it and those bushes got larger but nobody trimmed them so the groundskeeper guy that was retired as my neighbor he used to go pick up his granddaughter and he used to always complain it's like they don't even trim them they don't trim them anymore and that becomes a bit of a, a hassle so the only thing that I see when it comes to these policies with the plants is there's nothing to report. Like if you're a parent or a community, like there's no process to guide you to say, okay, I have to report to this person that this bush is overgrown and it could whack a little kid and knock it out if they're running through there, if they don't see it. Um, that was like my only thing regarding the whole plant stuff that just came to mind, so. Very good, thanks. Uh, our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. You can just stay there, she'll sit next to you. I'm basically going to piggyback on what I said before when I was in public comment and read to you that what this says. The board believes, in parentheses, supports the philosophy that the proper care and maintenance of its school systems, buildings, equipment, and grounds support the instructional program by enhancing student learning. then why is it that we have so many buildings in such disrepair? If we support and believe that this should be a policy. Oh, that was the deleted one. Nope, that's, nope. that's 3520. That's 3520. Um, I remember a while back when my daughter was in <coughs> elementary school in Timber Grove that the that a new principal came on board when I believe she was in fourth or fifth grade and started beautifying the inside and the outside of that building. She put uh, trains on shelves on the inside. She put flowers on the outside and the atmosphere changed completely. It was very different. You walked into that building and it was welcoming. And I don't feel that way when I walk into a building like Campfield Early Childhood Center, Lansdowne High School, Delaney High School, um, Colgate Elementary, Reisterstown Elementary, what I feel when I walk into those buildings is a cramped environment where students have a lot of difficulty learning. And I think you ought to practice what you preach because you're not doing it here. And that's all I have to say. The next policy for public comment is proposed changes to policy 3532 non-instructional services, physical plant services, restitution for vandalism. Ms. Bergman, you're the only person who signed up for that. Okay, so. You can, yeah, right, that's okay. Fine. okay, so I, I see this around in my community a lot. Um, for whatever reason, kids, sometimes kids are not even from our community, they come from outside in the nearby um, area boundaries and they vandalized our property like they'll spray paint on 
the sheds that are you know for equipment and stuff and um, they, they do they vandalize some of our greenery uh, that we have outside and I've seen times even Lansdowne Middle School for example outside they have these little beds like garden beds and time after time the school during the summer tries to get the kids to do like a little project to make it look nice and then someone comes and rips stuff out or they spray paint on it or whatever they do to vandalize it and when they come to fix what was been vandalized they just take the bush out or whatever they don't put it back they don't put nothing no plants back to make it look nice again it just gets ripped off and it's gone so they'll you know they'll clean up the brick and stuff but then they just rip off a bush and they don't put nothing back in and I would like to see that that this supports the willingness that if we're going to have groundskeeper that I know we do have groundskeeper they do more to our grounds on the outside than just cut the grass the same thing with our baseball diamonds like they're not properly maintained like it and you know it goes back and forth to rec and parks and the school well who's supposed to put the order in so they could get dirt in the winter time before winter starts in the fall to make sure that they maintain our baseball diamonds for our kids and then spring comes around and the diamonds not even pair no matter at how much you try to rake it because it just gets hard so um i think that we have to invest in the little details outside of our schools and make sure that when it gets vandalized, that we put it back nicely how it was before it was vandalized. Otherwise, people are just gonna keep vandalizing anymore because it doesn't look pretty. So that's all, thanks. Thank you, the next policy for public comment is proposed changes to policy 5410, students, service to students, school counseling services. Ms. Bergman. So the services for students for still counseling and the philosophy behind it, I really like the revisal of the social emotional support from the school counseling. Um, when I read this policy, it seems like for secondary, is kind of defining what a school counselor is supposed to be for that social emotional piece. I haven't seen that recently in BCPS when it comes to middle school. I feel like our counselors are our career counselor guidance, not providing that social emotional piece. And it gets very confusing because then they refer us to the social worker and the social worker is supposed to seek services outside to provide that social emotional support. But if you talk to anybody that's not too familiar with details of what a social worker is supposed to do, you're kind of thinking, well, the counselor is supposed to do that. So I like that on the standards, it makes it clear that the services are compromised for the program. Um, and is covering and bold that social emotional piece and development that the school counselor is supposed to support and encourage those skills and knowledge and attitudes for college and career and life ready. And I don't want our counselors to think there's just the college and career part because you need that child to be socially emotionally available and how they integrate, integrate um, engage with each other, their peers and their teachers, and make sure that they're focused on that piece too. So when you're creating the policy on it and looking over the, the rule of this policy, is make sure that that's a really key detail that um, you're gonna make sure that our sto school counselors understand how to provide that social and emotional support for the student, not just the career readiness piece. So. Thank you. Um, Ms. Saroff. Well, I'm basically going to piggyback on what Ms. Bergman said. Um, I don't think we have enough school counselors in our school buildings. We're often sharing school counselors between two and three buildings, which is insane. <coughs> and that's one of the reasons I think that we have so many behavioral problems. We also have counselors who are not really equipped training-wise or understanding of all of their, all of the details of what they're required to do. And they, they'll have a lunch bunch, for instance, and they'll pick 
a few kids to be in that lunch bunch, but that's one lunch bunch, when you should be having groups of kids who have these things on their IEPs. We don't have enough counselors. We do need to have these people trained. Just putting it in a policy is not going to be enough. We have to enforce the policy. And we need, and I like the policy, I like the changes, but I think we need to enforce it if we're going to change it. Thank you. Uh, the final uh, policy for public comment this evening is proposed changes to policy 7250, new construction designing school building design. Uh, and that, Ms. Bergman, you're the only speaker for that. Okay, so for the new construction design policy um, suggestion is I want to make sure that this board knows that when it comes to considering um, the design approach for new construction for replacement or renovation, that the board knows that they got to follow the federal, state, and local laws. Like, they have to follow that in order to move forward. You don't favoritize which laws you want to implement and for, uh, you know, and carry on with when it comes to this process. You want to make sure you're using a combination of everybody that's included in this process um, for the construction design policy. The other piece I know that is very clear when I'm reading this is that it's telling the board what the board has to do and stay compliant with the law. I get that. But where's the community piece? Where's the part of the board has to be engaged with this community and not set a limitation and also be compliant with the state, local, and federal law? Because th the community, you, you want that building, whether it's renovated or, or new, to have that fit in the community. You don't want like a giant castle sitting in the middle of like a, a city that doesn't really match up. So I think that piece there, there has to be some togetherness of being included in that part. But I do want to make sure that this policy defines that you have to follow your federal, state, and local recommendations all together. And then I like the other piece where we, we want to make sure we have this money. Before we make decisions on stuff, we want to make sure that money is there. Um, if we're voting on contracts and stuff, we don't want to be voting in the air. We want to see like the plans and make sure that that's available for whatever the project is before you vote on something. So um, I don't know. This is an emotional topic. There's so many things going through my head when it comes to stuff, especially with construction. But um, the design process of it, it shouldn't be selected to a limited few or thinking here or there. It really should be engaging and getting out to everybody and have everybody involved and actually take the extra effort step forward. If you know people are not coming to you, then it doesn't hurt to go to them type of approach is what I'm trying to say. Um, because we're not all next door here. <laughs> Some of us have to circle all the way around. <laughs> so um, that's what I would like to consider with this policy, to try to look at something out of the box maybe and it could work a little better. It doesn't hurt to try. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is item F, and it's time for the superintendent's report. Oh, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chair. You know, I recently have been reading a lot of news, and I just want to take some time this evening, not only to give my, my typical remarks, but to be a champion for public education. Many of you know that I am a product of Baltimore County Public Schools and, and uh, being a teacher and administrator, a parent, and sometimes it can feel like, and maybe this is not the intention, but it, there are times when it feels like public education is under attack. And so tonight I'd just like to uh, protect our teachers and speak for our teachers and our administrators tonight and give voice to the wonderful educators out there who I know are so hardworking, whom I've had the very pleasure of working with uh, over the years. So my intent tonight, my remarks tonight, are intended to highlight and celebrate collaboration in our school system. Uh, when you research the best schools and school systems around the world, 
uh, you'll find some commonalities. You'll find great teachers and you'll find results-driven administrators, which we have here absolutely in Baltimore County. When it comes to from the schoolhouse to central office, we have phenomenal people here. And so I just want to take some time to talk about what some of those uh, commonalities are. One commonality has to do with collaboration. Our, when you look and you research the best of the best, they invest in collaboration. And so I think that it's important for us to also invest in time for collaboration. As a new teacher, I know that many times I thought I could work in isolation. I thought I could do it all alone, all by myself. But I learned a lot from the teacher across the hall. I learned a lot from the teacher next door. As a principal, I had to call on other seasoned principals for help and support. Sometimes I needed to visit their schools Sometimes I had to visit other classrooms so that I would know better questions to ask, how they manage their, their programs, how they manage their classrooms. And then as I became more seasoned, it didn't, didn't matter if it was a teacher or as a principal, people came to me for the same. Those intervisitations are extremely important. That type of collaboration is extremely important. I know that in today's world, sometimes it's questioned. That type of collaboration is questioned, and it's questionable. But as educators and as professionals, we have to make sure that we invest in that, that type of collaboration and that we defend it. Every other profession has time for collaboration. Every other profession has time to observe each other's practice without <coughs> question. And I understand that everybody has been through school and everybody thinks that they are expert when it comes to education because they've been through school. However, our professionals are certified. Our, our professionals have studied what it means to be a teacher, what it means to be an administrator. And so those professionals need to be treated as professionals and need to be treated with re the same respect as we give all other professions to have to honor the time together. We can have our time together. We can do so ethically. We can do so responsibly. But we have to rise up as educators. Let our voices be heard. It doesn't matter if you're in the classroom. It doesn't matter if you are a, a, an administrator. You have a voice. Many times when we think that we're in various positions, that our voices are stifled somehow. Those voices have to be heard. You know why? We know what it's like to stand before children. We know what it's like to educate them on a daily basis. And we know what works and we know what doesn't work. We understand developmentally appropriate practice. We know our content. And we know how to transfer that content across. So sometimes people who have not spent time in the classroom question our practices. But we have to then defend those practices because we know that they work. I've been asked about the value many times of external visits. So as a teacher, it was important for me to share. Teachers share. But when school systems share, sometimes it's, it's deemed as corruption. Collaboration does not equal corruption. Collaboration is collaboration. Collaboration is learning. And we have to value that type of learning. And so we have examples of when that type of learning works. We, we know that when our new teachers have an opportunity to come together in new teacher orientation, it works. They get a chance to talk to one another, collaborate with each other. When our administrators get together on a monthly basis during principals' meetings, it works. They have an opportunity to share best practices, as they should. Why do we need to work in isolation? Why should we? And when school systems all over the nation are working on the same work that we're working on, why not share best practices and ideas? We know that in our leadership advance that we had last week, we had an opportunity for our human resources department, our facilities departments, our HR department, research accountability and assessment, our communications <coughs> office, offices, to get together to share what works, to, to look at, to chime in on the challenges, if you will. 
We don't always have all of the answers when we're working in isolation, but we can certainly work on those answers when we have a chance to get together. I don't want our educators to feel like their voices are stifled. Speak up and rise up. And when you don't, that's okay, I'll speak for you. Because I am you. I have been with you and I know what you're going through each and every day. So again, I hope that this, this little superintendent's report will launch your desire to rise up and to protect your profession. Because after all, you are professionals and you've earned it. The star video tonight will highlight an, an example of that type of collaboration, birth through five. I have to say that my own child benefited through the birth through five program. And I'm grateful for that. That program shows an example of collaboration between and among agencies. There isn't anything wrong with that. When agencies can help each other and when other agencies can help public education, bring it on. We want all ideas on the table to benefit all of our students. So with that, I'll turn it over to our star video tonight. Nice job, Kenley. Good job, Mom. That looks great. In Baltimore County, our Birth to Five services include several programs that provide services to very young learners and their families. These programs include the Baltimore County Infants and Toddlers Program, Baltimore County Public Schools Child Find Assessment Centers, and Baltimore County Public Schools Community-Based Instruction for Preschoolers who are receiving special education services. Our programs support children who specifically may have developmental delays or diagnosed disabilities that could impact their development prior to kindergarten. And so our job is to partner with families and our community agencies to ensure that every child has the supports that they need to enter school ready to learn. Good girl, nice. The program has been wonderful so far. Um, everybody's been very nice and it's very helpful for me to, and Kenley's made definitely great improvements. Um, I've been taught how to help her while nobody's here and every time somebody comes over it seems like she's definitely made improvements. But for parents who are, you know, on the fence about this program, it's definitely helpful. They come to your house and everybody's very nice, it's very professional. We get to provide them strategies and kind of be their navigator through these developmental milestones. We try and integrate these strategies into their daily routines, which is, can be a challenge, but it makes every case just a little bit different. And we can help them to grow and celebrate their achievements along the way. Hey, David, can I show you some pictures of some cars and trucks? <gasps> Look at this one. The process through Child Find was really seamless. Once I contacted Child Find, they gave me a date to come in, bring my son in for an assessment. We came in and there were a number of individuals from different backgrounds that explained to me exactly what the process would be from that point forward. And I just knew from that point forward that they would hold my hand and that we were gonna get through this, which initially I wasn't sure of that until I met that group of individuals. Make a match, look at that, you made a match. We did the assessment and shortly after they established some goals, identified his strengths and weaknesses and community-based services were started shortly after the development of that plan. So he actually had a special educator to come into his preschool program and work with him there and it greatly increased his social skills as well as his expressive language skill. I love Birth of Five services because when we think about kindergarten readiness, it's not really about what happened in kindergarten, it's about all of those things that happened leading up to that first day of kindergarten. In addition to that, many, many years ago, I heard one statistic, and it's what made me want to go into early childhood, and I think it's what makes all of our team members passionate about what we do. 90% of brain development occurs by the time a child is age five, 90%. We have this window of opportunity to partner with families, to work with our collaborating agencies, and really make a difference. 
For more information for referrals to the Baltimore County Infants and Toddler Program or BCPS Child Find for children under the age of three, please call 443-809-2169. If a child is three years old or older and not enrolled in a BCPS school, please call 443-809-2169. Three zero one seven. For any additional information, please contact Birth to Five Services. Again, we celebrate collaboration in Baltimore County <coughs> Public Schools. We champion our teachers and administrators, and we're proud of the work that they do every single day. Mr. Chair, that is my report. Thank you, Ms. White. Next on our agenda is item G, and that's the opportunity for me to give the chair's report. You know, there's a saying that uh, you're looking at things positively if you see the glass is half full. Uh, it seems to me that these days the Baltimore County Public School System's glass is full. Uh, since I last got to give uh, Chair's report, here's just a few things that happened. Uh, we had a ribbon cutting at Relay Elementary School for a brand new school, and uh, it's a spectacular place, and uh, the community uh, is thrilled that, uh, uh, that the new school is with us. Um, uh, we also had a groundbreaking for Victory Villa's new elementary school, a replacement of the old school there. Again, the community has embraced uh, the, uh, the construction process that's ongoing there. We even had a groundbreaking for Patapsco High School's substantial systemic renovation, uh, including air conditioning the entire high school. Um, and again, uh, the community uh, embrace, is embracing uh, that project. We even had uh, the drum core and uh, all kinds of uh, Patapsco High um, uh, presentations as part of uh, that groundbreaking. Last meeting, just before our meeting, we had um, a great dinner meeting with the Area Advisory Council uh, members. And just before this meeting tonight, we had a really fine uh, dinner meeting with the student council representatives from Baltimore County, of which uh, the person uh, to my right is uh, uh, is uh, a member as well as our student <coughs> member of the board. That leads me to introduce Josie Schaefer to give her comments. Good evening and happy Tuesday. I would like to congratulate all 113,000 students for a successful first quarter. The second quarter is a good time to further define yourself as a student and to continue to stay active in your community. I am so proud of Franklin, Summit Park, Seven Oaks, Gunpowder, Newtown, and Lines Mill Elementary Schools for volunteering with Kids Helping Hopkins to make 360 Build-A-Bears for children in the hospital. Staying involved in your community is a great way to learn outside of the classroom, and I can't wait to see more student activism as we continue through the year. Two weeks ago, I spent three days with over 100 student leaders at Baltimore County Student Council's annual fall leadership camp. This was a unique opportunity for student governments to discuss the mystery of the leadership and meet other SGA members from other than those in their schools. Even though I was stung by a bee within my first 30 minutes we arrived, <laughs> we had, I had so much fun getting to know a diverse group of students who were passionate about increasing the student leadership in their schools and in the county. Not only were the three days packed with fun activities, fall camp allowed students to get out of their comfort zones and learn about teamwork and communication skills. I would like to thank Jake Turner, Ms. Murray, and the 20 incredible student staff members for hosting such a successful camp. I was also able to visit Cockeysville Powell on October 18th to learn about the after school meal program. I'd like to thank Ms. Panowitz, Ms. Schulman, Mr. Roddy, and the volunteers at the after school meal center for showing me the process of meal prep preparation and distribution. This is an important program for our 52,177 students eligible for free and reduced meals. And I was surprised to learn that only 2% of the eligible students participate in this program. The after school meal program in encounters barriers when trying to expand the program into more communities because of extremely strict regulations, including requiring a sink to wash dishes when all the items besides serving foods are disposable. Meals arrive on site ready to serve, but sites can't serve meals 25 yards away from a kitchen. I encourage board members and community leaders to tour the after-school meal facilities to see the professionalism in preparing meals and help bring this necessary program into more communities who need it. Finally, I am so excited to start Lunch Bunch school visits with BCSC's President Jake Turner. He's over there. Um, <laughs> this event is designed for a productive conversation about a school's climate and culture and help myself and Jake learn about a school's individual needs. We will be visiting Franklin High School on the 15th, and I can't wait for, to visit more schools in the future. 
That's it. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. Next on our agenda, item I, is a consideration of the proposed 2018-2019 school calendar. Uh, and for introduction, I invite Dr. Mayo and Mr. Duke to come forward. At the October 10th Board of Education meeting, two calendar proposals were presented to the Board of Education for first reader. Since that time, we've had a public hearing um, to solicit input from the public as well as we've answered questions of board members. And this evening, the board is scheduled to vote on either option A or option B for the 2018-2019 school year calendar for Baltimore County Public Schools. All right, uh, is there a motion to uh, uh, move one of the two calendars. <coughs> Mrs. Causey. Mr. Gillis, before a motion is made, I just wanted to ask a couple questions of Dr. Mayo, if I may. Please. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. I appreciate that you um, did respond to emails that I had sent you. And I just wanted for this discussion, if you could please clarify the length of the school day for our school system. High school as students? As far as the number of hours you're yes, referencing? Yes. Six, six and a half hours. And can you please clarify for this conversation um, how that compares to other jurisdictions in the state of Maryland? We have the shortest school day at the high school level. And what is the difference between our school day and uh, let's say a very high performing school district such as Howard County? Howard County has a 6.8 hour day, I believe. <coughs> six hours and 50 minutes. So 20 minutes longer per day than Baltimore County Public Schools. That's correct. And uh, what is the state average length of day? I don't have that information. Is, is it fair to say that it's closer to Howard County than it is to Baltimore County? Most of the school systems have a six hour and 45 minute day. A six hour and 45 minute day. Okay, thank you very much. All right, comments, um, motions. Mr. Yulfelder. Yeah, I'm going to move that we uh, accept mo uh, option B. There's a motion to approve calendar B. Is there a second? Second. All right, there's a motion and a second on calendar B. Discussion on calendar B. Mrs. Causey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to uh, make an amendment to the motion that has been put on the floor by <coughs> my colleagues, Mr. Yulfelder and Ms. Miller. I would like to amend the calendar option B by taking a professional day from the beginning of the school year and moving it to Eid al Fatir as uh, has been directed by the Board of Education in a vote that we took in July of 2015. Um, and I'm. Ms. Uh, they can't hear you. Back. Is this not on? Thank you, uh, Ms. White. I'll repeat what I said. Thank you very much. I. <clears throat> offer a motion to amend calendar option B by taking a professional day from the beginning of the year and moving it to Eid al Fatir as directed by a board vote in July of 2015. After our former chair of the uh, Policy Review Committee had um, taken under consider work and consideration, uh, she brought to the Board of Education in July of 2015 at a board retreat the recommendation that where appropriate Eid the Eid holidays be um, directed to be professional development days. Um, I believe that, um, and I agree with my colleagues, that it has been indicated that there are significant uh, Jewish members of our community and our school system, and that it would be a disruption to the delivery of effective education and possible safety issues. Um, we know, and it's been brought up again tonight by our key stakeholders, um, and that staff has indicated BCPS has trouble filling open positions. And we know we have many long-term substitutes that use up our sub list. So there could be issues with um, even getting enough substitutes, but also in the fiscal issue of paying for the substitutes. Um, it's also an issue of providing effective education if we have a large number of student absences. So I would um, point to information that was presented to the board by PRC back in July of 2015 when the board voted. And it shows increasing Muslim student absences on the Eid holidays. Um, 
specifically Eid al hadda in 2013, 2014, uh, was almost 1,000 students. And so that was three years ago, and the trend has been rising. So there's every reason to think that it will continue to rise. Um, it's also equitable for the Board of Education to consider the three largest religious groups in Baltimore County to have acknowledgement and consideration under our equity policy 0100. I did email the staff about how 0100 was considered, um, and I did not get a reply to that email. I am going to make a suggestion, and I'm um, in how we can respond to Dr. Mayo did respond um, that we would not have enough instruction time if we took another professional day for Eid al Fatir. But I did the calculations, and to fit in a high school day requires just over six hours. So a six-hour day equals 360 minutes. If we add the 30 um, extra minutes per day, it adds a little bit more. So to get 360 minutes added onto the calendar, over 180 school calendar days, it only takes two extra minutes per day. And I would offer that we should do this. We should add two extra minutes per day <coughs> to equitably move forward with how we consider our community members. We've heard so many things tonight from so many people that dovetail with how it is right to do things. How are we making our students feel? How are we making our communities feel? How are we allowing time um, for people to get together? Um, so it would be fair to consider this. And, and let's be clear, I think it's important, and we've heard this too tonight, the teachers are already working those extra minutes. Our teachers and our students are trying to accomplish in 180 days what other school systems have extra time. So our teachers are already doing it. So as the superintendent said, teacher collaboration is important. So why not give those teachers literally a few extra minutes each day to step across the hall and collaborate? Give those students a few extra minutes a day, as we heard from our student council members and here tonight from our stakeholders, to go to a guidance counselor, to have a talk with someone about how they're feeling, how they're stressed, how we might support them in a better way, not only to, to support the whole social emotional child, but to have that increased academic output. So my suggestion is that we add those extra minutes per day. And if the board wants to consider later on in this school year to add even more minutes to the day, I think that that would be totally appropriate. So that is my, that's so you my have, motion. That's your motion. Uh, and we should have had a second before you had um, your um, um, support for your motion to amend the calendar. Is there a second to that motion? Second. All right. I, I'd ask Mr. Duke to please address Ms. Causey's uh, suggestion about extending the school day. There's a contract between uh, the system and the teachers uh, that identifies the length of the day. Is that correct? Correct. The master agreement says that the teacher day will not exceed seven hours, which is six and a half hours, and the duty day is uh, starts for teachers 15 minutes before the start of regular activities for students and ends 15 minutes after the dismissal of regular students. And the contract for next year, 2018-2019, has already been completed? The, no, we're currently in negotiations. However, that would have to be negotiated and that would have fiscal implications. All right, fiscal implica implications, meaning if it was longer than a six and a half hour day, there would need to be more monies out to teacher salaries. Correct. All right. And then, uh, I would presume that that would be the union's demand. And that would require funding authorities? Yes. Participation? All right. Any uh, comments? Mr. Discussion? Gales, we would also have to check this, the math on that as well as far as the two extra minutes that Ms. Causey has referenced. Mr. McDaniels. Um, I just had a question for Ms. Causey. Um, if the board were to adopt option A, which we still haven't uh, resolved, would your motion change to have professional days for the Jewish holidays in addition to the Muslim holidays if we adopt option A? I'm making my motion around option B. So if the board votes on option A, you uh, oh, just we become, you'll, we'll, you'll address that at that time. That's correct. I'll address that at that time. Thank you. 
Mrs. Miller. I have a question. Um, can you explain why the central office is uh, recommending option A, which stays open for the Jewish holidays, when we haven't been open for the Jewish holidays? It'll be almost a quarter of a century. As far as I... That was the cal calendar committee's recommendation. Calendar, okay, yes. but it's being put forward by the central office. You have two options. Two options, A and um, B. Do you understand what the thinking was? I mean, there hasn't been any uh, demographic changes. Is there, what was the impetus behind making that recommendation? Well, demographically, we don't know what changes have taken place. Um, and there is no reliable way to get that type of information. Um, the calendar committee felt that uh, faced with the, the shortest uh, student day, and with trying to build a calendar where we have a little bit of cushion in case we have a uh, rigorous winter, uh, it was felt that it would be best to go ahead and recommend uh, closure on the Jewish holidays and have the calendar holiday neutral, if you will. Um, and that was the, the basis of the recommendation. But I'm, I assume they must have discussed what the possible ramifications for the system would be. Uh, there would be quite an expense in getting sobs to cover. We for did those speak days. about the safety issue. We spoke of, uh, spoke uh, at great great length about um, substitutes, um, but it was still felt that until we and we understood the risk. Um, the calendar committee did understand the risk that uh, the system might be taking. But again, um, it was uh, felt that uh, we really didn't have a handle demographically as to whether or not the situation um, from 25 years ago is still prevalent um, in 2017. Um, we had sort of a general idea of possibly um, having issues in some schools, um, but not system-wide. Uh, but that calendar committee felt that it was uh, their recommendation to go ahead and close on the holidays and have the board uh, make a decision relative to the calendar that was being presented. I'd just like to point out to my fellow board members that it just seems like there's an inconsistency here because 20 some years ago when they made the decision to close for the Jewish holidays, it was based on uh, or at least according to Mr. Yulfelder, who was involved in that, it was based on this idea or belief at the time that it would cause a great disruption to the system. Now, 25 years later, with no further information, we're being asked to throw that out the window. Uh, so it just seems like a, very much of an inconsistency, which drives home the point that we need to have a policy set for the board that will cover all religions with a threshold and data to support that. So Mrs. Miller, if I may interrupt, um, mm -hmm. the motion made by Mr. Yulfelder is to approve the calendar that has the schools closed for both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Right. So and I am you are arguing weighing about the other option. I just wanted to get information on the rationale behind that recommendation. Um, okay. Other comments, discussion? Mr. Yulfelder. Okay. The decision to open or close schools on two Jewish holidays, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, is not a decision based on religious preference. Let me repeat that again. It is not a decision based on religious preference. The propaganda that has been preached to us for well over 15 years er is erroneous and avoids the truth. The truth is that this decision is based upon economics and interruption to the educational process. In 1999, in the Koenig versus Felton case, and this was a case brought to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth District, the court concluded that these closures were supported by contemporary and technical purposes of avoiding decreased instructional effectiveness and waste of scarce educational resources on days with a high rate of absenteeism of teachers and students. And it's interesting to note that there were several groups 
uh, that uh, joined in in an amicus brief, and one of them was the National Council of Islamic Affairs, which noted in their brief the support of closing schools for religious holidays when wasteful expenditure of educational resources would occur. The brief further stated that the county made a pure secular decision based on practical administrative concerns that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are not productive instructional days. In 2005, in the case of ADC versus our board, Baltimore County Board of Education, the Maryland State Board of Education upheld our calendar, noting that we find it would be legal for a local school system to close for the purpose of recognizing a religious holiday for one particular faith or another. But as in the Coney case noted, that the school system must have some secular purpose for designating school holidays, such as economizing educational resources on days with high absentee rates for both students and teachers. As I said, this is a decision based on economics and an interruption or absenteeism. And I want to first address the interruption or absenteeism created. In 2010, the Associated Jewish Charities, and they do this every 10 years, engages in a census of the Jewish population. It's a census is very similar to that taken by the United States government. And in 2010, extrapolated today, there's an estimate of approximately 9,000 Jewish students. And, and as a side note, I have provided these numbers to Dr. Hairston's administration, Dr. Dance's administration, and to our own PRC. Now, the absence of a child does not cost the system any money. However, in those schools that have a large Jewish enrollment, the absenteeism of so many students creates interruption to the educational process. And it noted that many non-Jewish parents will keep their kids home from school the same day. Now, let me give you a personal observance because I lived for 30 years directly across from an elementary school. Uh, I saw buses come with one, two, three kids, and the school population that, that day was put into the library where they either watched movies or spent the day, and then the buses went home again with one, two, three kids. Uh, obviously, this does cost money. Let's, let's, let me also uh, turn to the economic uh, component of the secular reasons. Um, there are some in the Jewish faith that recognize and observe Rosh Hashanah as a two-day holiday. For this, we have records. Our records indicate on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, approximately 235 teachers took the day as a religious absence. We've been advised that a substitute teacher costs $91 a day, and if you add 10% for payroll taxes, let's talk about $100 a day for a substitute. Math is simple. The cost for the substitutes for the second day of Rosh Hashanah is a little over $23,000. I believe this is clear that the first day of Rosh Hashanah, the number of teachers that will take a religious absence would be any, as was presented to us, would be anywhere from 12 to 20, where, well, let me say 12 to 20 percent of our 9,000 teachers uh, are estimated to be the Jewish faith. So for my purpose, I took halfway, 16 percent of the 9,000, and therefore at $100 a day it will cost the system $160,000. If you multiply that, including Yom Kippur, you got $320,000. And of course, I'm making the assumption that we're able to find 1,600 substitute teachers in the subject that they that they're needed. Highly unlikely. So what happens in schools where subs may not be found and classes, in effect, have no teacher? Certainly, one would agree this is an interruption to education. And all of us received an email from a school nurse of the Jewish faith, and she told us that she observes the second day of Rosh Hashanah as well. And she goes on to say, and I'm quoting, there has not been one year that there has not been a coverage problem on the second day of, for school nurses. For this year, I'm aware that at least eight schools were un unable to find substitute nurses to cover the school because so many school nurses are out and there's not enough available substitute nurses to go around. 
So if substitute nurses aren't found, um, what happens to those schools without coverage? I don't know the answer. So what does it really mean? It's really very simple. If you select option A and decide to keep the schools open for the two days, then it'll cost the system in hard dollars anywhere from three to $500,000. In addition to creating uh, this interruption to the learning process. If you decide the loss of three to five hundred dollars and the severe interruption of the system is not very important, then we should select B and have the school closed for those two days. Um, may I ask, uh, before I ask, uh, before I recognize Ms. Schaefer, Mr. Duke, um, uh, we have a motion to amend that's uh, presented by Mrs. Causey. Um, how does that impact the uh, number of days of uh, classroom time for high schoolers and um, and obviously it would eliminate one weather day that would be the impact correct well obviously it would reduce one student day um, and uh, currently uh, with option um, option B option we have, B, B. Uh, we have a, a cushion of three and a half hours by uh, adopting the proposal that's on the on the uh, before you right now, we would have a deficit of three hours at the high school level. Assuming using five, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, four inclement weather days. Well, we would still maintain the five inclement weather days. What I understood was that we would take one day away. Teachers would start one day late. Okay. Right. Um, and then the EAD would become a PD day with no students but teachers on duty. Okay, and the uh, five inclement weather days are, built, in, w are built into your calculation? Correct. That's so if we only had four bad weather days instead of five, we would make the state necessary mandated lesser threshold for um, high school students? Yes. All right. Um, and weather, um, you gave us weather information last time. Ms. Schaefer. It just makes me nervous um, with, as a student to ask other students to miss two days of school in a row. I miss one day, of, excuse me, sorry. I miss one day of school and I feel like I can never catch up until the quarter ends when they start letting you go to coach class all the time. Um, a lot of students at my school in the Northwest area and as you move around the school, there are little pockets of Jewish students, but they do go to shul for the first day of Rosh Hashanah and also the second day and they miss a lot of school for, they miss the second day when we do have the first day off. And I don't wanna ask of them to, um, to miss two days of school, especially in a row, cause you can say that there are no tests that day. A uh, teacher will still give an exit ticket that's worth 60% of your grade. Um, you could say no more field trips, but a lot of high school and middle school students do not go on field trips, so it doesn't really matter. It just, I don't wanna ask of them to miss two days of school in a row, especially as they're, um, approaching rigorous classes with five AP classes or in middle school, they're in programs. I don't want to ask them to do that in a row. Also, um, with safety with the buses, I live near a shul. I live near Bethel, and it's right off of Hooks Lane and Park Heights. And on the first day and the second day, there are cars everywhere. There, are, it's it's a madhouse. They close down like one lane when there are normally two, and I don't want to see. L buses that are filled with elementary schoolers at like 8 o'clock, 8.30 when people are in shul. Um, I feel like that would be disruptive and scary. So. Mr. Birch. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Um, <coughs> I want to thank the, our, um, our presenters for um, taking our questions. I wanted to ask you if I could. Uh, we have approximately, when we add all of our full-time staff and all of our part-time staff, we have perhaps just under 20,000 employees in our system. Is that a, is that a reasonable sum? And of that amount, perhaps 9,000 are engaged in classrooms, instructional activities. Is that, is that a fair statement? Anywhere from the 8, eight to 9,000 range, that's correct. Sure. And if we had to take a guess uh, at the number of nurses the, who, who, are, who are tireless in working in our schools, would we say that the figure is a, uh, you know, j under 200, figure there's at least one per school, some have more than one, so we're talking about maybe 200 or so nurses? Every school has one nurse, some school may have a health assistant as well. Sure, and, and um, all of these employees, all of our part-time, all of our full-time employees, our professional, our cert certificated folks, they all apply for their positions, is that right? 
That's correct. And they would fill out an application, whether it's online or it's a paper uh, application. Is that also correct? Yes. And on any of those means of application, whether it be online or whether it be in paper, does this system inquire as to any employee's um, religious faith? No, we cannot ask that a question. And we don't. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, our students, we have um, approximately 113,000 students across our entire system. Um, when students enroll, does our system at any point <coughs> have any staff ask any families or any of our students what their religious faith is? They should not. And whether if they even have a religious faith. No. Are you aware of any records about with regard to religious faith for either our almost 20,000 staff members or almost 113,000 students that our system maintains? No. Safe to say we don't maintain them because that information is simply not captured at any point by any of our schools or our personnel. That's correct. Okay. Now, with regard to existing policy, um, and um, staff who may have a, who may have her faith and who may have a religious holiday, is there a mechanism in existing policy whereby a staff member may apply to have off from work? They don't have to report to school because of, because of, of religious reasons. There is such a policy, isn't that right? Yes. And that policy is policy 50 or strike that 4203. Correct. And that's. As I say, that's a current policy. Is that right? That's correct. And it doesn't say only, it doesn't just say the Jewish faith. It doesn't just say uh, Muslims in our country. It doesn't, it doesn't identify any specific, by name, faith. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, uh, with regard to our students, students who uh, go to school every day, if, if, if a student and if their family, if it's a religious fa if it's a family that, that has a religious faith and there's a religious holiday, whatever that faith may be, is there a mechanism whereby the student can, can be excused to not go to school on a particular day <laughs> for a religious purpose? That I do not. I'm, I would have to defer that to. <coughs> Well, there is one. It's it's uh, 5120. That's the that's the the policy, and that policy actually refers to state law. And my my recollection, having spoken briefly with the system's uh, representative council today, uh, is that in fact it, it it makes reference to state law that permits this. So, without any action being done on any calendar that would provide any religious holidays, any student, any staff member could on any religious holiday under existing policies apply not to come to school or apply not to come to work if they're one of our employees. Is that correct? That's correct. Correct. Without us doing anything. Now, I want to compliment David and also want to compliment Howard Lippitt. And I, I say that because David brought us his personal experience. And he didn't, he, he very clearly said that <coughs> This was not being made on religious preference. Uh, the quote I wrote down was, this is about um, uh, economics. And, and? And, and I can't read my handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's uh, like. Uh, the educational process. Uh, well, yeah, OK. So <laughs> I'll, I'll accept that. The second part to it is, David didn't say at from his experience, from having lived across the school, from when this policy was first, when we first began incorporating these two religious holidays in our school calendar, David did not identify a specific number of staff or students. He, was, he very clearly did not say. And the second part to this is, could you just remind us when we first began recognizing these two holidays in our calendar? It's like 1994 or thereabouts? 1995, school years okay. last year. And in those, in those years, we had a superintendent. And it turns out that I had the occasion to talk with the superintendent. And I specifically asked him this question last year. I said, Dr. Berger, what, if any quantification, 
existed at the time the decision was made to incorporate, incorporate these two religious holidays in the school calendar? His response was, none. That's why I compliment David. David was very clear. He gave his anecdotal experience from two decades ago, because it's been over two decades since we opened schools on these religious holidays. Howard Lippitt, in his remarks to me and my colleagues, said that this was not about respecting a religion. Howard practiced in the advocate's art, and I admire him for this. He said, the best available evidence supported his position, but he did not say the best evidence. And he did not say that there is evidence of specific statistics for either students or staff and their religious um, beliefs or worships, worship <coughs> patterns. God bless you, yes, you, if I might say that in the discussion. <laughs> that being the case, coupled with what Dr. Berger said to me, I even called over another colleague who was with me from our board at the time, and Dr. Berger shared the same thing with him. I note, over two decades later, we now have a, we have a significantly changed Baltimore County. The recession was not good to any place in our country, and it was still, it was very tough on families in our county. It has remained tough for, count, for, for citizens in our county. We have higher rates of poverty in our county. We have large, sizable populations of farm students in our county. Now, a farm student is a student that has qualified for a free and re reduced meal at the school when schools are opened. Isn't that correct? Yes. Which means when they come to school, they can get something to eat that day. Is that right? Yes. Now, when the school's not opened, they don't get anything to eat that day. Their parents, if they work, struggling to get through, they have to make alternate arrangements for their children when schools are closed. And for many families, they have to hire daycare. They have to take money out of their pocket because they have to make these alternate arrangements because they love their children. But when our schools are closed, their children are not getting the benefit of that nutrition and the family is taking a potentially another hit on their finances. The district I come from, District 6, we have large numbers of Title I schools. We have large numbers of farm populations in elementary, middle, and high school. This is 2017. It is not 1994. As much as I respect David, and I believe his statements were very credibly made, and I believe Howard Lippitt's comments were very credibly made. There is a way, with existing policy, those staff who want to have off on a religious holiday can do it right now. Any religious holiday, whether it be these two holidays that are currently identified in calendar B, or any other one. Secondly, any student can likewise have off, but schools are open, and those children who go, who are farm students, they will be getting fed and their parents won't have to find alternate means for daycare, pay out of their own pocket, out of concern for the safety of their children when our schools are locked because of a vote of this board. I would encourage my colleagues, after their own thoughtful deliberation, to keep these thoughts in mind, to oppose not just this motion, but calendar B, and instead to vote for calendar A. Thanks. All right, Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with um, extreme respect I have for people of all faiths, I just want to clearly state, I wasn't sure if we were just speaking on the amended motion, or but to the original motion, I'm going to support option A with the same reasoning that I approached uh, our previous votes on religious holidays. Um, without uh, some objective information about the secular costs that are associated with uh, uh, keeping the schools uh, closed or uh, keep, keeping the schools open, um, I am going to uh, support that, uh, you know, we follow the 
calendar committee's recommendation and um, uh, accept op option A. Very good. Mrs. Miller. Uh, I have uh, a few reasons that I'm supporting option B. Um, number one is uh, I had requested from the system uh, quite a bit of information about um, religious leave taken by teachers on um, Rosh Hashanah day two uh, because we have been open for that so we have that data and also for the Muslim holidays um, now it bothers me that we have been doing this process piecemeal last year we dealt with only the Muslim holidays and this year we are dealing basically with the Jewish holidays and I'll just reiterate that we really need a policy for all religious holidays. Um, but the data that I compiled um, that was supplied by the central office gave me concern that there would indeed be uh, an Im uh, quite an impact for staying open for the Jewish holidays. Um, and I did share that data with the board. Now, um, I believe that until we uh, set a policy for all religions and a threshold, uh, I think it would be unwise to make any changes without knowing what those effects would be on the system. So I do urge the Policy Review Committee to take action on my motion that is now almost a year and a half old from August 2016 to set that policy for all religions in an equitable way and end the questions around fairness and equity. But until we have that data, uh, my recommendation is to not make any changes um, because we don't know what that impact will be. Ms. Miller, just to m make uh, one comment, and that is to pick up on Mr. Yulvelder's and that is we can't have a religious policy. We can have a secular policy, and there's a distinction. Mrs. Right, Ann, did but, you want to speak? Oh, could I add one more, one more point onto that? Um, yes, I, I understand that. It would be have a secular purpose, but it would deal with all religions. But I did, one other point was, I, I think um, Ms. Causey brought it up, about the recommendation that had come out of the Policy Review Committee recommending that we um, set professional development days for the Muslim holidays, and I believe that we had a consens consensus around that recommendation. Mrs. Hen. Mr. Chair, um, I'm interested in supporting Ms. Causey's motion with one amendment, if she'd be willing to make it, and that is the removal of one snow day, if we could reduce the number of um, allowed snow days to four, which that's, would address that's a, the deficit. You have to speak into the microphone, but the answer is that it's unnecessary without speaking because there's no other days in the calendar, so there would only be four snow, four inclement weather days. Okay. Correct? Correct. Uh -huh. Mr. Young. I'm confused by that. There's, right now there's five in the calendar, yep. correct? And so the motion was to make one of the professional development days and use that on the Muslim right. holiday. Yeah. And we've provided some historical data for us, the number of days we've missed over the last five years as well. And on average, we're missing over five days. So that would be a challenge. Well, then it would be a challenge regardless. I understood the motion from my clarification, I understood the motion to be to reduce the uh, entry days for teachers by one. In other words, they would report one day later. Correct. And then use the PD day for the Eid in June. Am I correct? Yes, that's the correct motion. But I also suggested that we add <coughs> two minutes to the school day. Correct. To accommodate it so that we could maintain the five schools five school days, the five snow days, excuse me. Mr. Young. Dr. Mayo, our 10-month professionals, they have three or five 
discretionary days that they can take off, which which number is it? It's five. three personal, so it's a total of five. So a total of five days. Um, and the process for them to take those days off is that they have to request it with their principal, correct? And is it their responsibility or does it become the principal's to find the substitute? The teacher can request substitutes through our sub finder system. Okay. So that's how substitutes are secured. Okay. And, and it's, like it's a call up, it's like a call in type system. Okay. And it's up to the principal to or is there a situation where the principal can actually deny a teacher that discretionary day off? The question is leading to if we were open on those religious days and teachers were requesting off, would the principal at some point be able to say, you know, I have 15% of my staff requesting off, I can't really run the school like that, and the next person coming in saying, no, I'm sorry, you can't have this day off. Is that something that's permissible? I mean, a principal could say I would prefer for that person not to take off, but nothing can preclude that person from taking the day off. I can, I'm gonna call in sick now. I mean, there are other variables, other types of leave that a teacher could then say they're gonna take. So that would be a hard argument to kind of okay. hold up against. All right, thank you. Questions, comments, Mr. Stewart. I think I'll be uh, brief, but uh, my question relates to the edict from the governor with respect to the, the calendar and the school year itself. My understanding is previous to that, we had some flexibility as far as the length of the school year and seeking additional time should we need it if those inclement weather days exceeded the average. Is that right? Well, if we did not have the constraints of after Labor Day and ending by June 15th, we probably would be ending the following week. Um, and we would not have as many front-loaded professional development days for teachers. We would have more time to build in for more hours. Right. So it seems as though, I mean, particularly because we're faced with a situation where even with the, the option that has the most inclement weather days, it's still not necessarily going to be enough for us. And then we might have to go back to the state or at least back to the drawing board with respect to what kind of calendar we're going to create here. That's true. And, and a lot of school systems that may actually have the flexibility that we do not have, um, in, the, in the event we have a pretty bad winter or just various inclement weather days, it doesn't always have to be snow we're talking about. They may have other flexibility or other options within that calendar throughout the year where they can say, okay, now this is going to become a school day. So when you show that effort to the state, then they will start waiving some of those days if necessary. Our calendar is so tight, we don't have that option. Well, it seems, it, I understand that. It seems that maybe this is a longer term issue in that the effort that needs to be demonstrated to the state may well come to the conversations we need to have as a board with our teachers about a willingness to, to look at the timing of our school day and see if we can in good faith come to a conclusion that also addresses the edict that's been handed down to us. And it just so happens that the 2018-2019 calendar year uh, eliminates two day opportunities, one being the election uh, day and one being that June 15, the last day of the year, is this year would be on the, that this calendar year would be on a Saturday. Correct. Anyone else, Mr. Yulefelder? Just two things. Um, um, to answer uh, Mr. Birch, uh, Howard County uh, closed for the two Jewish holidays prior to 1994, and Montgomery County closed prior to Baltimore County closing. It, okay. Mr. Virch. Uh, David, thank you for that. And I appreciate the fact that you didn't gild the lily. You didn't pretend that you live in a different jurisdiction. You were sharing because you wanted all the board members to have the benefit of all that information. I would note, in a final observation, <coughs> any additional religious holidays would impose that same burden on our students who get their meals at schools in my district and in your individual districts or if you are countywide representatives throughout the area that you move through and attempt to represent at your most worthiest during our board meetings. Um, and secondly, the penalty that would then fall upon those very same families if they have to make additional alternate arrangements for daycare and the safety of their children. Those are the last comments I have. Mrs. Miller, then Mrs. Causey, then we're gonna have the vote on the motion to amend. 
Um, regarding the um, the shortened school, well, the front loading of the professional development days, um, the edict from the governor doesn't affect how late the teachers can work, correct? I mean, they can go past the June 15th day. Isn't that just a Contractually, day? they cannot work more than 191 days. So right, that so is calculated in, when we built the calendar, that is one of the, the, uh, the uh, criteria that we have to be cognizant of. <coughs> okay, but that, that directive from the state did not require, was not a requirement on teacher The executive days. order did not speak to that. Okay, so the front loading of the professional days is not a result of that. It's for whatever other reason. It, it has been the practice of this school district to go ahead and front load um, those PD days for uh, teachers. Well, isn't, isn't the answer to Ms. Miller's question that uh, between Labor Day and June 14, there are only enough days to have school days only and not professional development days during the school year? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. I mean, every PD. I think that's what she was asking. Yeah, well, okay, I'm, then I misunderstood. But any PD day where, where students are not present is one less student day. Um, but we also have to take into account that our contractual year for teachers is 191 days. Okay. Um, and I had another point. Now, now I've lost it. Can, can we come back to me? Well, <laughs> when, the last, the last word on this is going to be Miss, Mrs. Causey. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, and I would, I would point out that it's about balance. It's about balancing the needs and the constraints of a very large, very complicated, and very diverse county school system. So in balancing all those needs, it is unfortunate, but we cannot take into consideration every single student absence due to religion or every teacher's absence due to religion. But we need to, in an equitable fashion, recognize those large numbers of students and or teachers that would be absent and disrupt the program of education, whether because of student absences where they would require extra time from teachers, which would disrupt the teacher's regular flow in their classroom, or whether it's the uh, absentee of our teachers that disrupts the <coughs> educational process and, in addition, creates a fiscal burden on the system. To that right. end, I wanted to quickly ask, how many subs do we have in the subfinder system? 2,500. 2,500. And um, how many subs do we have on long-term substitute assignments? I have to get that information for you. Okay, so we have uncertainty. And that would be, as far as long term, that would also equate to someone who may be out on maternity leave, other types of leave. It's not just if it's a vacancy. Okay, certainly. There's many reasons to have long term substitutes. So there is uncertainty as to the number of substitute teachers we would have available. There is uncertainty, but evidence given in terms of the number of population of our county in the uh, disruption related to the Jewish holidays, and there is evidence from the school system's um, absentee system that is showing an increasing student absence on the Eid holidays. So given that, I would say that it's, it is appropriate, it's balanced, and it's trying to provide the most effective education for our students. Um, I would okay. say huh? just that I will change my amendment to not adding the two minutes extra, since that may be um, uh, illegal. Who seconded that um, amendment? I did. Uh, do you accept just her? Just remove the extra snow day. Do you day. accept her amendment to remove the extra minutes to the school day? But let me just ask: How do we address then the hours? Well, we can remove one snow day and if this board decides as a policy to review the length of day and it can be worked out with our with our bargaining units because the the real fact is it is the shortness of our school day that limits our school calendar that's it we've got howard county that has uh, multiple uh, days that they're given off and their system does it for the educational purpose of cultural diversity. So that is an aspect that could be considered. Um, and I did want to point out that Mr. Virch has added 
to uh, the upcoming PRC, um, the school calendar issue. So that issue will be start to address on a long-term basis. All right, um, so let's, let's deal with the amendment. Is there, there's now a suggestion that she wants to change her amendment to only be to shift one professional development day from before Labor Day to June 5, 2018, which is the Eid al-Fitr. And so essentially, it would be left then to the, to the central office. Instead of dictating how they handle that, central office can then figure out how to handle those hours. Right, either one less student, one less snow day, or if we really tackled the issue, which is how short our school day is, correct? Well, and just, they can do it a different just way. Just so we're clear, the school system has nothing to do with knowing when it's going to snow, all right? If I'm there, talking if there about is, the length of day. <laughs> exactly. If there are eight snow days or inclement weather days, we're going to be behind the eight ball one extra day with the suggested amendment to the calendar. Um, I, would, it, I would agree to that. All right. Uh, so, I would also add that uh -huh. um, besides the inclement weather days, if we do have a rigorous winter, we also have to take into consideration Late early start. releases and delayed entries. That's right. Because the hours come into play as well. In one year, we found ourselves having used nine inclement weather days, and on top of that, we had numerous early dismissals and delayed entries, yes. which complicated the hourly um, requirement. Very good. Mr. Virch. Thank you very much. And I'd only add this because of the additional information that was provided during the um, amendment to the motion. Um, the idea that there is absentee data of any relevance over two decades since this policy of a or this effort to incorporate religious holidays in the school calendar went into effect has any validity in our county is significantly at issue. Absentee data, when we don't know for whatever reason folks are not here, then it is about as useful as what may have been done in, say, the 1990s. The second piece to this is that continuing down this road will only result in additional pressures, and we still don't know what, if any, legal basis has been accepted by the courts right, I, for, a, for, a think, for a fellow jurisdiction. I, I, think, we, I, think, I you, think we've had... You had said that Ms. Causey was the last Ms. one to Miller, speak, and that's Ms. why Miller, you were the last. Miller, you have the last word. Thank you. I, I just like to respond to that because the religious leave data that was supplied to the board um, by the central office and I compiled was current data from the years 2012 to 2016 because it was the days for Rosh Hashanah Day 2. And we have that, and that's current data. So the fact remains is that we have an option B. There's a lot of talk that, oh, we don't have any space. We have an option B that closes for the Jewish holidays, that meets the mandate of the state, and that is not the issue. Okay. So the motion uh, to amend, the, mo the original motion is calendar B. The motion to amend is to take one administrative leave day and shift it to June 5, uh, which is the Eid al-Fitr day. Um, so all in favor of that motion to amend, please raise your hands. So it's, uh, we'll do a roll call. Yeah. I'd like to have a point of order. It was it was insinuated that I did not give that's relevant okay. information. That's, that's all right. Mrs. Miller cleared it up. Okay. All this right. is a that's it. BCPS Very document. Good. All right. Roll call. Ms. Causey. Yes. Ms. Eaton. No. Mr. Hayden. Yes. Ms. Hen. Yes. Mr. McDaniel. No. Ms. Miller. Yes. Mr. Stewart. No. Mr. Yolfelder. Yes. Mr. Virch. No. Ms. Schaefer. Yes. Mr. Young. No. Mr. Gillis. Yes. The motion carries. Now, the original motion, uh, I don't think we need any more discussion, is to approve calendar B. All in favor of the amended calendar B, 
please raise your hand. All right, roll call again. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Eaton? No. Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. McDaniel? No. Ms. Miller? Yes. Mr. Stewart? Yes. Mr. Yulefelder? Yes. Mr. Birch? No. Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. Gillis? Yes. All right, that uh, calendar B as amended um, uh, passes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mayo and Mr. Duke, for your hard work. Next on our agenda is Dr. Mayo, so please stay put. Um, I'll be brief. I would like uh, board consent for the following personnel matters. Uh, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, deceased recognition of service, certificated appointments, and area education advisory council appointments. Is there a motion to accept uh, uh, agenda item J1 through 6. So moved. moved. <laughs> Is there a second? second? Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Thank you. Um, next is item K, new business administrative appointments. For that, we call on Mrs. White. Thank you, Chairman Gillis, members of the board. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Assistant Principal, Hereford High School, Specialist, Board Certified Behavior Analyst, Office of Special Education, Executive Director, Performance Management and Assessment, Department of Research, Accountability and Assessment, Coordinator, Technology Education, Office of Career and Technology Education, and Manager of Facilities Maintenance, Office of Facilities Support Services. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit K-1? So, so moved. moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? <coughs> Aye. 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 All right. That motion carries. It's back to you. Okay. Members of the board, I present to you the following individuals for administrative appointments. I would like to ask them to stand to be recognized when I call your name and with any uh, friends and your supporting cast members as well. Uh, so our first uh, <coughs> recognition, we'd like to congratulate Deborah borden Karasak, who, our new, who she is our new specialist board certified behavior analyst. Congratulations, Deborah. Do you have anyone with you here tonight? <laughs> Wonderful. Congratulations. Congratulate Kevin Connolly, who is our new Executive Director of Performance Management and Assessment. here with you tonight? Yes, my, my wife, former employee of Multiple County Public Schools. <laughs> <laughs> um, she is a current educator with, uh, working with a four-year-old classroom. Very proud of you. Okay. Wonderful. Congratulations, Kevin. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> we also congratulate Michael Grubbs, coordinator of technology education. <laughs> Michael, congratulations. Do you have anyone here with you tonight? <laughs> Wonderful, yeah. congratulations. Let's <laughs> also recognize Ashley Hickman, uh, who will be the new assistant principal, Hereford High School. Yeah. Have with, here with you, I think we saw your supporting cast members <laughs> earlier tonight. And then my current principal and my new principal. Wonderful, there you go. congratulations. And Scott Welsh, our new manager of facilities maintenance. <laughs> Do you have anyone here with you this evening? <laughs> Very good. Congratulations. Those are our administrative appointments for tonight. Thank you, Ms. White. Next on our agenda is consideration of action taken in closed session. And for that, I invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Leave. As usual, everyone's leaving. <laughs> right, right. Even Mr. Handy's leaving. How about that? <laughs> That's <it's> personal. <laughs> so good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered two appeals regarding one um, regarding a confidential employee matter, and the other 
a student matter in your quasi-judicial capacity. Uh, both were considered on the record as there was no request for oral arguments made by in either case. At this time, would it be appropriate to confirm the actions taken by the board in closed session in those matters which were summary affirmance hearing examiner number 1730 and 1819. And I have recused on one of the two. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session understanding that Mr. Virch uh, recused himself on one of those two? Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. Thank you. And both orders will be on, on the table. All right. Next on our agenda, item M, is contracts. And for that, I invite Mr. Stort to take stage. Thank you. Uh, members of the board, uh, the Building and Contracts Committee met earlier this evening. We uh, are forwarding for your approval items M1 through 3. <coughs> All right. Uh, is there a motion to approve M1 through 3? So moved. All right. Since there's a uh, comment from committee, no second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Stort. Next on our agenda is board member comments. I would immediately ask Mr. Hayden, but first I ask Mr. Hayden, do you want to be first or last? I think I'll be last. <laughs> Mr. Young. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Young. <laughs> you know, hey. So I believe it's next week is American Education Week, and in looking at what NEA has to say, uh, it says it will present Americans with a wonderful opportunity to celebrate public education and honor individuals who are making a difference in ensuring that every child receives a quality education. So with that, I would like to thank both our teachers and our education support professionals for all that they do. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Young. Ms. Hen. Thank you. In last week's New York Times article, which many of our stakeholders cited this evening, How Silicon Valley Plans to Conquer the Classroom, <laughs> Natasha Singer and Daniel Ivory write, close ties between school districts and their tech vendors can be seen nationwide, but the scale of Baltimore County School's digital conversion makes the district a case study in industry relationships. Professor Rob Reich of Stanford suggests that school districts establish clearer rules governing their relationships with vendors, particularly with tech companies racing to win over the gatekeepers to America's classrooms. Otherwise, parents could lose trust in the system. He writes, school leaders should be just as concerned about the perception of corruption as actual corruption. Our own ethics policy states, the board, recognizing that our system of representative government is dependent in part upon the people maintaining the highest trust in their public officials and employees, finds and declares that the people have a right to be assured that the impartiality and independent judgment of public officials and employees will be maintained. It is evident that this confidence and trust is eroded when the conduct of public business is subject to improper influence and even the appearance of improper influence. I call upon my colleagues on the board to consider um, this as a wake-up call and to reconsider our responsibilities to govern. Maryland boards of education are established by state law to govern the county school systems in their jurisdictions. We are here for that one purpose. I call upon you to um, revisit our ethics policies. I call upon us to um, request an internal audit of all programs established to date and to keep in mind our purpose when conducting our board business. Thank you. Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Ms. Sin. The board has had a number of learning opportunities in the last month or two, but lessons can be learned only if they are acknowledged. One of those lessons was that despite the prevailing wisdom that held that the board cannot ask for funding not pre-approved by the county executive, when the board stood strong and voted to add Delaney and Towson to the state funding request, the county executive acquiesced. We now have the hesitant support of the county executive and the clear support of Comptroller Francho. We drew a line of demarcation between political interests and the needs of the school system, and it paid off. Another lesson was a series of lessons, really. Upon reporting by the Baltimore Sun and the Maryland, that the Maryland State's Attorney was investigating Dr. Dance with regard to the Soups Academy and the exorbitant amount of travel and expenses incurred by the previous superintendent for trips with unknown school system benefit, 
and the in-depth investigative reporting that ended up on the front page of the New York Times regarding symbiotic relationships between the BCPS central office and ed tech vendors that accompanied STAT to our system. The board and the public should understand by now that asking questions of the system, getting answers, and providing oversight is the duty of the board. We should be supporting rather than disparaging and opposing each other's information requests. Any person lacking the intestinal fortitude to ask questions and evaluate decisions made by the central office is service on the Board of Education. I believe a new standard for active board governance has been set for the board with accountability to the public. The board can make BCPS a successful school system, but the buck stops with those around this dais. I look forward to seeing the positive effects on our system going forward if the board will embrace learning opportunities with humility. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say briefly I have the wonderful opportunity next week to participate in a boys to men tie ceremony at Catonsville Middle School. Uh, that will be on November 15th. And this is the second year that they've had this type of ceremony that involves the young men of the school. And uh, with our uh, focus on school climate, um, it's been a very positive uh, collaboration between the PTA, community partners, and the BCPS team to uh, bring young men uh, that self-police themselves in that school and um, have created a wonderful environment for learning and, uh, and behavior within the school. So um, I'll uh, have another report at, after uh, next week's uh, meeting, but I'm very much looking forward to uh, being at Catonsville. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Birch. Thank you, Ed. Uh, it's been uh, quite a um, uh, uh, two months since school opened. I recently had the opportunity to go to a number of our middle schools, whether it be Stemmers Run Middle School or whether it be Deep Creek Middle School or whether it be my uh, middle school alma mater, Stemmers Run, and to attend their uh, magnet uh, showcases. Um, there is literally a new narrative being written in our middle schools. There's more to do, and we have some very good folks engaged in that, in that effort. And when you talk to the kids and their families, you, you hear it from them. And um, um, I encourage all of you to come out to our middle schools, even Roger Hayden. Uh, secondly, with regard to our high schools, uh, I was able to go to Kenwood High School and to go to Overly High School and Eastern. Hey, Daniel, would you reach over and swat him? <laughs> uh, we, will, we will take that from your three minutes. Um, uh, uh, Eastern High School had their makerspace program in conjunction with the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Ferlita was there. Some folks in the chamber were there. The folks who have a makerspace uh, sort of headquarters in Baltimore were there. There's a lot of really, really good things happening in, in those high schools and others. Uh, I was able to go to the Victory Villa groundbreaking where I had actually been a student for a school that's no longer there, but it was fun to be there and to uh, talk with a neighbor who was an uncle of a, of a, of a, of a, of a student who was a fellow student of mine. Uh, the Halstead Academy, uh, I was there at the PAL Center and I was able to see the students I had talked about earlier getting their after school dinner uh, because in fact it was an open school day. Uh, I was able to go to Elmwood's 60th anniversary, and I got to meet Batman and uh, <laughs> real life heroes like um, our firefighters who were there in force. And I was also able to go to our McCormick Elementary School, another one of the Title I schools in, in the district uh, that I represent, and they have this um, really interesting data room. And I won't say anything more about it, but uh, our superintendent, uh, I'm sure, is aware of it, and I would encourage board members to speak with our principal uh, at our McCormick about that interesting data room. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There you go. Ms. Schaefer. <laughs> One quick thing. Uh, <laughs> I invited all the board members to visit my school, Pikesville High School. Uh, you should have got an email from Ms. Decker, and now it's on the recording, so <laughs> you all have to come. <laughs> it's the 16th, 8.30 to 10. Please take me out of class. It'll be so much fun, 21st century learning. <laughs> Mr. Yulfelder. Um, the one fast question, uh, uh, Doug, uh, uh, Chuck, is that where we donate ties? Is that uh, they got donations, but I don't think the board did it. I think they no, got No, no, I meant 
it's open for donation of ties, I if I remember. So. Yeah. I think when well, they got that covered, I think. Uh, so you don't need any more ties? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Uh, no comments. Finished. Right. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To be brief, I would like to echo Board Member Julie Hens and Ann Miller's comments and suggestions. As a BCPS parent, a taxpayer, and a board member, I hear the concerns of our stakeholders tonight and the emails and phone calls and texts I have received around the recent investigative news coverage from the New York Times, the Baltimore Sun, the Towson Flyer, and the BaltimorePost.com. It's provided volumes of information that, as a board member, I had not received through the board. To say we received information in weekly updates is uh, inaccurate. A single statement of an activity uh, does not indicate the location, the days gone from the school system, nor significant concrete educational benefit for RBCPS students. It is enough of a challenge to perform the due diligence that I try to perform in making informed decisions for the benefit of our students with fiduciary fidelity. But to realize the lack of information is disheartening. I believe it is a lack of sufficient oversight by the board and board leadership. It's also a function of the former superintendent being able to share information as freely as he did want to whenever and however he chose, but he decided to provide the minimum that he did and the board leadership and the board tolerated it. The focus of the travel seemed more making and giving speeches than collaboration, and I do <coughs> believe in collaboration, but there is a difference between collaboration and marketing, and the amount of marketing spend seems very pervasive, and I hope that the board will pursue ways to understand exactly what is a significant and concrete benefit, not only to travel of our top leadership and other um, leadership, but also with the external site visits that are occurring in our schools, because uh, it was not apparent to me in the ones that I have been on. Um, I also am looking forward to the um, Education Week. I'm also chaperoning a um, field trip to Washington, D.C. with middle schoolers. Um, and to reiterate, there are wonderful things happening in our school system, but we need to do, make better decisions, and we actually need to hear the teacher voice. So I encourage the superintendent telling the teachers to rise up and collaborate, and I do hope that this board takes that high-level approach to evaluate the time that we allow the teachers to do it not only with the actual length of the school day, which is mission critical, and them being paid for the time they're already spending working so hard on behalf of our students, but also in recognizing the initiatives that have been started, how that impacts the teachers, and also what are the opportunity costs coming forward. STAT is now reaching a critical mass. We need to get started with the budget of how much money is appropriate to spend when we have seen limited results. I have more to say as usual because there are so many complex issues, but I do want to thank all of the uh, community members that came out and our um, key stakeholders who give us so many important things to consider, and hopefully we will act on them. Thank you. Mrs. Eaton. Thank you. I would like to thank um, Ms. White for her comments during her superintendent's reports especially for standing up for teachers, staffs, and school site visits. You are a true champion for BCPS. Thank you. And as far as the school calendar, I was going to vote for uh, calendar A to stay consistent with my comments from last year that I believe that no religious holidays should be on a public school calendar. But I am not disappointed that calendar B did pass. Thank you. Mr. Stewart. All right, board members, so I have a few thoughts uh, to share with you tonight about Lansdowne High School, about what's ahead, hopefully, and the subject that Ms. Miller wanted to emphasize, which is state involvement. Uh, I didn't really want to bring all this up at the beginning of our meeting, but I think it's worth spending a little time on now. Uh, I will try not to set any new records as far <laughs> as length of comments go, but we're a talkative bunch, and I'm afraid it's my turn. Uh, I will save some of my uh, comments as to fiscal constraints and what happens if we reject this project until later. So uh, as you know, the comptroller of our state invited all of us uh, to tour our high school for Lansdowne. And I, for one, uh, have chosen not to be a part of using our kids as footballs to score points in a high-level game of campaign politics, as was done with such tours of other schools in our county. 
And that's why I, along with Ms. White and local electeds and local officials, chose to tour Lansdowne High uh, today, along with Ms. Bergman, of course. And that being said, uh, I have reached out to the Comptroller's office to seek a substantive dialogue, though not with success as of yet. So today's tour is one of many tours uh, I've had and visits I've made to Lansdowne High. It's a, a school and a facility that we've grown very familiar with. And no, we didn't need to take the tour to know that it stands out as wholly insufficient for our kids. The worst facility we have in our county. We came together at Lansdowne as a show of support to evidence the fact that the community's deeply held and wholly justified concerns are in fact our concerns too. And recall, that's why we rejected the limited renovation. It's why we demanded a more fulsome project, which this community deserves. And based on what we know, and based on what we heard today from the principal and the engineer in response to question after question, the project promises to deliver a school that has the look and feel of a new school, that promises to be the best renovation this county has ever seen. Moreover, the Comptroller's tour purports to be for the purpose, and here I quote, to learn more about the proposed renovation, end quote. And so I'm excited for his engagement, but if you'd like to learn more about the renovation, then I hope you would also take a tour, as suggested, of uh, Pikesville High in the coming weeks. There you go. <laughs> I was there a couple months ago myself, and we'll be going back again soon, maybe even with Josie, yes. our student member. Uh, Pikesville is the school, of course, on which this renovation was originally based. I say originally because although Pikesville may have been the standard we were shooting for with its $40 million renovation, we're actually going to exceed that standard and its scope with our renovation, which promises to be around $60 million. I was there when the comptroller <coughs> promised clearly that Lansdowne was getting a new high school, and when he said clearly that this is not about the money, but respectfully, accounting for our fiscal challenges for the next several decades and doing all we can to serve kids while trying to overcome those challenges seems to me what we signed up for as board members. And as Ms. Causey said, our job is to balance things in this very complex system. I agree. Nor have I seen any analysis of the county's finances from the comptroller's office to suggest a different reality, to suggest a clear path for a new school instead of delay for years, if not decades. However, it's clear our state officials, the comptroller and the governor included, are very focused on our schools here in Baltimore County and in supporting our families. So that's why tonight I am formally saying that I would welcome a commitment from our state to fund its maximum share of a replacement school as allowed by law, which is 56% of the school. So that's anywhere between 50 and $70 million. And I encourage the board members who have the ear of the comptroller and the governor to relay this request. Unless and until that time, we cannot consign our kids to many years, if not decades, of deeply upsetting conditions at Lansdowne High School. We have to act now. We have to act for the kids who are there now and for kids who are gonna call Lansdowne home for generations. Fortunately, the project we're gonna be presented with in just two weeks may do more than simply right egregious wrongs. It might be life changing, but we have to consider it in good faith. So final point, and you know, hang in there. I will say this, it's a deeply personal issue to me. It will be the most important issue I work on as a board member. I have no political plans going forward. I'm not running for this seat or any other office. I'm not trying to embarrass or support any particular elected official. I'm simply trying to do the right thing here, and that means working on this project and with the Lansdowne community every day. In fact, I was just on the phone, Ms. Miller, earlier today with a member of the leadership of Lansdowne's PTA, and this person was nonplussed at the idea that we would reject the renovation out of hand simply because, as you clearly stated, a state official instructed us, or at least you, to do so. Ultimately, when we are presented with this renovation at the next meeting, I hope you will allow us to have a process, a dialogue with the community through presentations and town halls and coffees and phone calls and so forth. I ask you sincerely to not short circuit this process, but engage in a good faith discussion with me and others about your questions, your concerns, and about whether this project is worthy of our Lansdowne community. People and the kids we serve, they deserve it. Thank you. Mr. Hayden. Uh, I, actually, I want to go first. <laughs> All right, we'll begin again. Um, I don't think I can duplicate any of the heartfelt comments I've just heard. And the one thing they all indicate is a deep feeling that people have. I'm not worried about the microphone. Can you hear me? No. <laughs> uh, the deep feeling that people have about education in Baltimore County. 
and the desire that we all have to make it better. The fact that we disagree, that's sort of what it's all about. Disagree, discuss, and let's come to solutions that will make it better for the kids. As I used to say in another lifetime when I was on this board before, the kids are the bottom line, and they really are. And if we don't believe that, we shouldn't be sitting around this table or in this room. So we should do everything to express our opinion, to work for the kids, and to make things better. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next meeting is November 21, just a couple of days before our Thursday and Friday schools closed for Thanksgiving holiday time. Adjourn.